Welcome to the second in a new series at the Mahindra Humanities Center called What Next? Possible Futures. I'm Steve Beal, Executive Director of the Mahindra Center. And it's a pleasure to be speaking today with Heather Cox Richardson, Professor of History at Boston College. Professor Richardson's books include Wounded Knee, Party Politics, and the Road to an American Massacre, 2010. To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party, 2014. And most recently, just out, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. Uh, Professor Richardson comments on American politics in many forums, uh, and she hosted the aptly titled Freak Out and Carry On podcast with Ron Suskind. Welcome, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. Let's start with your new book. Uh, for those who haven't had a chance to read How the South Won the Civil War yet, uh, can you begin by explaining the title? Yes, the title was not mine. It was actually a colleague listened to me talking about it and said, well, that's obviously what your title should be. Uh, the, the argument in the book is that the ideology of the Confederacy, the idea that some people are better than others and should rule the majority of us, that ideology moved west after the Civil War where it gained a new foothold and gradually came to take over American society again in the 20th century after World War II. And that once again, we're fighting that same ideology. Uh, to try and restore American democracy, the idea that in fact the world moves best when everybody has equality of opportunity and equal access to resources. So what it is is a look at the ideology of the Confederacy and how that idea that some people are better than others and should rule everyone has been in conversation with and usually in conflict with the idea that every person is created equal in America. And can you say a little more about how that happened or why that happened and what you see as some of the ebbs and flows over time? Well, the rise of that ideology as the hallmark of American democracy comes out of the early 19th century. And, you know, if you think about it, it's a, it's a real question in human society, certainly in Western human society, like how do you make a society work? It's just a, a central question. Is it true that every person, and in the 19th century, of course, they're talking about men, should be equal? I mean, that, that's such a radical idea, that idea that the American government was founded on. And not everybody's convinced it's right. So for out of the early 19th century, you get, again, people in the South, especially people who enslave large numbers of other human beings, usually more than 25 to 50, who begin to coalesce around the idea that they are really the ones who are making society move. They're the ones who know how to plant cotton. They're the ones who know how to manage a workforce. They're the ones with connections and they're the ones with education and they're the ones who, you know, travel in Europe and have masterpieces on their walls. And all of this signals the idea that they're really kind of better than everybody else. And by 1858, you're actually having people in Congress articulate that and saying, you know, Jefferson was wrong. This whole idea that everyone is created equal is crazy. Uh, that's not the way the world works. And we're going to create a new society based on the idea that a few of us really should rule. And that, um, that ideology, of course, is the one that Abraham Lincoln stands against and, and pulls the Republican Party against to say, no, that's not what American democracy is. But that idea, um, that pushback against that oligarchic ideology of the Confederacy is behind the, the American Civil War, of course. And it seems like in 1865, democracy should have won. It should be a done deal. But what I'm talking about in How the South Won the Civil War is how that, it, that moment co uh, coincided with another really important moment in American history, and that is the movement of Eastern Americans across the Mississippi to settle the Great Plains. And one of the things that the book does is it looks into Western history as a political um, entity. You know, the West is a political entity and says, you know, the West always liked the idea of hierarchies. You know, Western settlers, um, certainly by the time you get American settlers in the West are deliberately creating societies in which white men are superior legally to uh, indigenous peoples and to Mexicans and Mexican Americans and to Chinese who are coming in. And so that idea of, of, of um, democracy really fits very uneasily on the West. But the idea of the Confederacy, that white men are better than other people, fits quite naturally. So the book takes a look at how the West 
adopts this idea after the war, and then how the West becomes a really important political entity in America that comes gradually to, first of all, work with the South to stop anti-lynching legislation, for example, but then let, uh, gradually in the 20th century to take over the American Congress, but also the American psyche, if you will, with the spread of the ideology of the American cowboy as the epitome of America. And the cowboy, of course, has embedded in it this uh, both racial and gendered hierarchies that are so popular in the Confederate South and then, of course, in the American West after the Civil War. Um, so will there be a time, do you think, when the South finally loses the Civil War? Are we at a moment where that is looking like it might be a possibility? Yes, I think it is. And this is, uh, you know, I, I've said in a, in a number of fora, I believe America is right now at a knife edge. You know, this is the moment. Is this the moment where American democracy slides full force into the idea that some people are better than others and should rule the others? Or is this a moment when we renew American democracy? And this particular moment, I feel extraordinar extraordinarily hopeful about. You know, people write to me all the time and they say, you know, um, how do you continue to be hopeful? in all this, you know, isn't it, isn't it over? And, you know, I'm writing these uh, letters from an American every night, um, sometimes until four or five in the morning. And I think, and I actually say to them, do you honestly think I would be doing this if I thought the game was done? You know, I, I'm not staying up all night for my health, let me tell you. And the reason that I feel like it is a new moment and we have the opportunity to create a new moment and a new future is partly because it's clear we're at the end of a, a, a micro-American uh, political moment, if you will, the, the period from World War II uh, to the present, but also because for the first time, really, you have... Uh, uh, people of color being able to, to participate in our American political system on terms, somewhat terms of equality, but also because you have American women, uh, white women as well as women of color. And I say that in that order because white women have tended in the past to vote as their husbands or fathers did. And that split from their, their male counterparts, start, they started to split from their male counterparts with the election of Ronald Reagan. And I believe I saw the statistics this morning that uh, college educated white women have split from Donald Trump at, th at the rate of 39 points as of this morning. I think it was 39 points, whereas they voted uh, in 2016 only against Donald Trump by seven points. So the idea that women are stepping up and saying that's not the world we want and we have the numbers to make that stick seems to me to be a really important political development. Um, I think you've started to get at this, but what do you see as different um, about the protests against police killings um, and against white supremacy more broadly in this moment? What do you, what, what is, I mean, what is different about these protests than protests in the recent past or the more distant past? Well, what I see with the, the police protests, which are, um, you know, one of the phases of things that have happened since the election of uh, Donald John Trump to the presidency, is, uh, is probably going to sound familiar to you. And that is that when I look at the protests today, and there's a lot of things going on, and I don't want to, to um, elide those other things simply to follow this one, um, one thread through, and we can talk about those other things, but the one thread that I see that I find fascinating is how much it looks to me like the abolitionist movement before the Civil War, because uh, in both of the movements, the abolitionist movement and the, the police movement right now, what, you have, what you're seeing, and perhaps as with the, um, the civil rights uh, protests of the 1960s, or perhaps more the 1970s, what you're seeing is uh, a vast uh, population getting behind the movement for African American rights in uh, people who were not previously in favor, not, not that they weren't in favor, they weren't really paying attention. And now with the, as with the abolitionist movement, the movement today for Black Lives Matter is one where a lot of middle-class white people, poor white people, um, people of other, um, of other ethnicities have gotten behind this movement. And to me as a historian, the question is, why? I mean, the idea that, that somehow um, there has not been violence against African Americans by police forces in American history is just crazy. I mean, African Americans have been suffering at the hands of police officers pretty constantly since we got police officers. So why now? 
like why are things different now? And what it looks like to me is to say it looks much like it looked in the 1850s. A lot of people who didn't really pay much attention to what was happening in the black community when there was such horrific violence in the 1980s, for example, in the 1990s, but especially the 1980s, are looking at what's happening to African Americans now and recognizing at some level that that same economic deprivation, the same violence, the same social denigration, all of those things impact them, they could be next. And suddenly by speaking out for African Americans, they're speaking out for themselves. They're starting to recognize that they too could be on the losing end of this stick. And that's one thing that Donald Trump has really made clear for all that he talks about being a populist. Regular Americans' lives are in trouble and they're starting to come together to speak up against that even if they are not necessarily saying yes i really care about confederate statues or yes i really care about black lives what they're saying is i care about taking down a government that is not operating in my interest oh and it's not operating in this person's interest either and so what i see is in this moment and in this really extraordinary moment is this idea that somehow the government is privileging a certain group of white men, usually men, and everybody else is left out. And that happens to have created us, uh, uh, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement has given a focal point for that sentiment the same way that the abolitionist movement did in the 1850s. Thank you. Um, where do you see the locus of change or the main locus of change? I mean, is, is it in these social movements? Is it in electoral politics? Is it at the national level? I mean, you know, Mitch McConnell clearly isn't going to let any meaningful uh, police reform bill get through the Senate as long as he's in charge. Do you see it in state politics, local politics, or all of the above? So, so this is a great question, and I have to laugh, Steve, because I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a secret here to the to our listeners, and that is that Steve and I went to graduate school together, so he knows how hard a question that is that he just asked, um, and it's one that I've spent my my really career thinking about, and that is how do you create change? That is what historians do. What creates change? But my specialty is what is the link between voters or people on the ground because they're not always voters. And, uh, and, and politicians, like how, how does that link actually happen? And that's really complicated if you think about it. You know, how do you get a politician to do what you want a politician to do? And um, my particular answer to that is uh, that I am an idealist. I believe that ideas create change. And so where I see the, the, the fundamental change happening is in our political discourse, is in what people are saying. And what I mean by that is, you know, when, when people are in the streets, they're making a statement. I mean, they might be speaking, but they're also making a statement. When they tear down monuments, they're making a statement. When politicians feel pressure to do certain things because of their constituents saying things, they're making a statement. When, the, when NASCAR decides that it's not gonna allow the Confederate flag to be shown any longer, that's making a statement. When Comcast or some, uh, uh, some corporation stops funding uh, right-wing speakers, that's making a statement. And so fundamentally, I see the, the change coming from this change in political conversation that is coming from the bottom. Now, the next part of your question is, where do, what does that change look like? First of all, you change the political conversation, but then where does change happen? And one of the things that is dramatic right now and I think that political scientists would bear me out on this, is the degree to which people are acting at the local level. Uh, ordinary Americans are running for office, but they're also doing things like um, ordering tickets to a Trump rally and not showing up. Uh, they're, they're actually putting their, their skin in the game and demonstrating that democracy is not uh, it, it, you know, as a contact sport, you actually have to be part of it. It's not a spectator sport. So, um, so it happens that the, the actual beginning of the change starts at the local level, and I think we're seeing it. And this, I think, is a really interesting moment because it harks back to 1964, to the election of 1964, when Barry Goldwater got the Republican nomination, in part because Nelson uh, Rockefeller um, uh, spectacularly self-destructed because he had a problem with a zipper. But um, uh, the in that Nelson um, Goldwater 
but was perceived as quite a radical character. And he only won his state of Arizona and uh, five deep Southern states, which is its own story. But everybody, when they talked about that at the time, were like, oh, he's washed up, it's all over. What people didn't see is that Goldwaterites went into, the lo into local politics and into races that nobody was paying much attention to, school board races and select people's races and judgeships and things that were at the lower level. And that engagement in local politics really pays off many years. It pays off in the short term because you have control, for example, over school curricula, but it plays off in the long term as people who have come up through the ranks have experience with how you become an elected politician. And a lot of those people are now in office. And that, um, that focus on the local level now, um, which is so visible to people watching for it, I think is a harbinger of change in, you know, a decade, 15, 20 years. The, the consensus at the moment seems to be that Trump's attempt at backlash politics, his dredging up of silent majorities and law and order isn't working. Um, can you imagine that changing? before the election or is it is it being seen as just what it is you know dredging up old slogans I think I think you put your finger on. Do I see that particular thing changing? Absolutely not. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but I won't discount absolutely won't discount something else happening between now and November. You know, people are always saying to me, what's going to happen in November? I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. So don't ask me what's going to happen in November. There is a, there are plenty of things that could happen between now and then. And we might, you know, be able to talk about some of those. But in terms of what worked in 2016, I think he's got a real problem. And he's got two, there, there, there's a problem with that approach to the election for two reasons, the upcoming election for two reasons. The first is that, um, the pandemic, the, the novel coronavirus pandemic is not responding to that. I mean, you can talk all you want about, um, you know, the racist slogans he's using and about how this is the Democrats fault or how it's a hoax or any number of things. That does not change the fact that a lot of people are dying. And once you have been through that, um, you're not people are, most people are looking at that and saying, we've got a huge problem here. And recognizing the degree to which Americans have been insulated from pandemics really since um, Ronald Reagan had to get on board with AIDS in the 1980s. If you think about it, we've really been very, very lucky in this country because we developed such a good response to pandemics and, and, and to epidemics. And, and of course, the Trump administration just gutted that. So for the first time, we're looking around and going, wait, we're supposed to be out in front of everything and we're behind the rest of the world. We have 4% of the world's population and 25% of the deaths so far. And if you remember um, when, the, when it first broke, there was a... a uh, model that suggested we might have 143,000 deaths in America over this. And especially on the right, people poo pooed that as, you know, this, you're just alarmist. There's no way that's going to happen. It couldn't be the case. Well, as you know, last night's statistics said we were up to 121,000 already, and numbers are going up, not down. So again, if you'd started in this, uh, if you'd said, told people four months ago that we would be where we are now, they would have been horrified. And right now, people are living through that because the pandemic is not responsible responding to narrative, it's responding to reality. So that's one thing. But the real place that Trump has run into trouble is, um, I guess there's two other places. The first is that the military came out um, after what happened in Lafayette Square when the, the, the troops were used to tear gas and shoot rubber bullets at peaceful protesters. And they looked at the fact that Trump allegedly was um, trying to call out the regular military to use against American citizens. And at that point, military leaders said enough. And they came out and they said, we, we stand by the Constitution. This is not okay. And with that break between the president and the military, that really gave cover for a lot of people to stand up and say, we're not okay with this either. So that was a big deal when the military came out and stood against Trump. But the other thing, and I think this may actually be the most important, is the degree to which uh, Trump has become a figure of fun. And, and I don't mean that as in um, people are having fun with him, but people are making fun of him. And really uh, the, the footage that we saw last weekend on Saturday from the Tulsa rally with people yawning and with the, um, 
the empty stands, but also with the fact that so many members of the Trump administration, st starting with his campaign uh, coordinator, uh, Brad Parscale, but also Trump talked about it and a number of their surrogates did and the Fox News Channel personalities talked about it. They talked about how the place was gonna be packed and that a million people had, they weren't gonna show up. They knew a million people weren't gonna show up, but the million people had gotten tickets. And this just showed out of the box that, that Trump was gonna have this triumphant campaign. And they really hyped it. And then no one came. I mean, they threw a party and no, about 6,200 people came for a venue that was uh, could hold 19,000. And they actually had built an outside stage to handle overflow crowds and no one was there. And if there is one rule in politics, it's that you're either consolidating power and moving up or nobody wants to be seen with you. And that the fact that all day Sunday last, last week and then into Monday, uh, social media was just piling on what how stupid the, the campaign looked, I think it's going to hurt. I think a lot of Trump supporters uh, are not going to want to be seen with a person they perceive as a loser. And I think Trump realizes that too. You think how hard he's hit the word loser again and again and again. He looked like a loser. And if you look like a loser, you're going to lose popular support. Even if people still like your policies, nobody wants to be the one going to the party that's got no one at it. So, um, so I don't think the politics of resentment are going to continue to work. Although, of course, he doubled down on them hugely. Uh, was it last night in Arizona? Yeah, Tuesday night in Arizona. Um, and you know, the the audience responded actually quite uh, frighteningly with a response calling up a racist statement that he then repeated that I won't repeat. And that was a little frightening. But are that many people going to respond to that? Even Arizona, where he gave that speech, is now trending purple. So we'll see. But I don't think so. I think I think that moment is past. Um, let's stay with coronavirus for a moment. And um, since you're a historian of the Republican Party and of American political culture more broadly, how, how predictable would you say was the administration's response and the response of Republican governors? Um, including the widespread denialism about this, what what are the what are the roots of that, and um, and did this have to be politicized uh, in the way that it's been? Well, the the answer to the second part is the the most important one, I think. Did it have to be politicized? No, I mean, no. This is a public health crisis. the The virus is not checking our political affiliations before they decide whether or not it's going to before it decides whether or not it's going to infect our blood i mean that's just it, it is it is insane that we treated this as a political issue i, I meant and, more that whether it's inevitable given that um you know given this the the discourses of politics in our time um and given the recent history maybe the longer term history of the Republican Party, whether it was inevitable that it would be politicized in this way. Well, well, I would love to say that nothing is inevitable, that, you know, we can rewrite history tomorrow. I mean, we can rewrite the future tomorrow or even this afternoon if we choose to do it. But what you're asking is, is it a surprise that the Republican Party did this? Sadly, no, because the Republican Party really since the 1990s, and you can trace it back further, and we can if you want to, but has risen to power and held on to power by advancing a narrative that the Republican Party is... And mind you, this is not the traditional Republican Party at all. It's a cabal that has taken over the Republican Party, a cabal of movement conservatives, which I can talk more about, but they are a, an ideologically driven party and they are not, in fact, their ideas are actually not terribly popular in uh, among ordinary Americans, but they have managed to stay in power by advancing a narrative that they and they alone are standing against secular communism embraced by people they call liberals, by which they mean anybody who is not them, which is how you get, for example, Newt Gingrich purging rhinos, Republicans in name only out of the party. Well, those rhinos that he was getting rid of are in fact, were in fact traditional Republicans. They had a much longer history with the party than he did. But they have, uh, have always managed to stay in power simply by creating an other and saying that those other people are trying to destroy individualism and free enterprise and all the things that make America great. So faced with a pandemic, 
to which there was not an easy answer and a pandemic that was going to require cooperation that was going to to mean we did have to rely on the federal government that they are so intent on uh, dismantling they really had no choice but to go ahead and say this isn't real it's not going to it's not going to amount to anything the thing that always surprises me about that though is even recognizing that and even recognizing that they were bound to that narrative in many ways i still don't see an end game i mean i look at this and i think where does this go i mean when when people are dying when americans are dying at these extraordinary rates higher than any other country in the world we've become the epicenter how, how, in what scenario does that play out well politically? And I simply don't see one. And when the funny thing about it is that those of us who sort of plot about politics, you know, often we run um, bad scenarios as well as good scenarios. And all of us can come up with ways that the Republicans could have handled this, that Trump could have handled this, that would have been devastating for the Democrats. And rather than trying to do that, they simply went with, it's not happening. And that just suggests the degree to which, to me, it suggests the degree, the degree to which the current day Republican Party has become divorced from reality. It's this magical thinking. If we don't talk about it, if we say it's not real, it won't be. But the pandemic wasn't listening. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, monuments, um, which in a way you could say is not the, you know, far from the more, most important set of issues emerging out of the recent protests. I think that's clear. And yet people are investing a lot in that discussion. Um, and most recently, uh, some of the protesters in Lafayette Square tried to pull down the Andrew, Andrew Jackson statue. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. And, um, you know, it may be the case that Confederate monuments should definitely go, but what about, and, and then there's some, been some discussion about, well, just replace them with Union generals, and U Union generals arguably have blood on their hands from the conquest of the West. So just talk, I'd just love to hear you talk about the politics of monuments and memorialization in this moment. Well, the, the fun thing as a historian for what's happening to the monuments right now is the macro picture. And that is that one of the things I always talk about is how when statues come down, regimes change. I mean, it's a hallmark of regime change is statues coming down. Think about every time, you know, from ancient history, when they change statues, they change rulers. And that is the, the larger picture, I think, of what's going on here and important to keep in mind. Now, if you come down from that big level of people are expressing dissatisfaction with the country as it is, and they're changing the direction of it, you come down from that. My first stop on the, the step down from that is Confederate statues and Confederate commemora commemorization. Um, I'm dead set against federal statues or commemoration on any federal or state property because those people were traitors. They came out and, uh, uh, and, and tried to destroy the United States. And the idea that we are celebrating in any way people who tried to destroy our country and our government seems to me to be just wild. You know, think of it, tell me any other country where they look at a rebellion and say, hey, yeah, these people are great. Let's put them on universities and statues. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So I, I don't think they even should be in the mix. Um, uh, and by the way, you know, people hear that and they know I'm from Maine. My people were actually fought for the Confederacy, not for the Union. Um, but uh, that's sort of a long story. So I, I actually have sort of bona fides on that side. Um, so so I, don't, I think that's one, uh, that's, that's one category, like get rid of the Confederate statues. Now, do you want to get rid of all of them? Um, you know, you, you probably want to keep some just to commemorate, you know, in context off of federal or state property in a museum why they were so popular from the 1890s to the 1920s, because of course they weren't put up at the time, which is, which is an important distinction. But then you get the other question of what about all these people in our past who, you know, weren't great? 
you know, what do you do with, um, with Ulysses S. Grant? And I think people kind of under, misunderstand what Grant was up to in the West. It's, you know, again, it's all complicated, right? We do history. And that brings up the difference between history and commemoration, and they are not the same thing. So if you're going to write a history of, um, um, uh, now I can't think of a single, if you're going to write a history of, oh, here we go, Chester Arthur. And, and not mention, because again, I'm going to pick on him because I'm not even sure there is a statue of Chester Arthur anywhere. He was a president. He was the president after uh, James Garfield gets assassinated. If you're going to, um, to do a statue of Chester or write a biography of Chester Arthur, you need to mention that he was corrupt before he got into, the, into, the, um, into, the, into office. And you need to talk about all of that. And you need to talk about how he got put in office. That's a, that's a biography. Now, if you're going to decide to put up a statue of Chester Arthur, what are you putting up? Are you commemorating his corruption? Or are you commemorating the fact he left that corruption behind when he stepped into the, into the White House? You know, so the difference between history where you really do want to dig into what really happened, because what historians do is we study how you create change, that you have to have a really accurate picture. When you're commemorating something, the question is, what values are you commemorating? What does that person represent? So for example, Andrew Jackson, whom I quite frankly loathe, um, he's on our money, on our $20 bill, not because he uh, was, a, was a ferociously um, uh, uh, genocidal murderer of Indians, but because he represented in the Depression a man who was on the side of the people. That's why he's on the 20. Now, when you, when you put a statue of him up, which are you commemorating? What are you doing? So the real question for the rest of our statues, I think, is to look at what values those things are celebrating. Because if we're looking for perfect people to put on pedestals, there are none. And the, the, you know, one of the things that always gets me when we talk about Andrew Jackson or whomever, like virtually every guy who's on a pedestal treated women like crap. And I look at those and I'm like, you know, if we're going to start making a line here about who's acceptable, uh, I think that they should all go, but then you got a problem because you need some sort of historical memory. So the question is, what values are we commemorating? And when you look at it that way, yeah, we need to lose some of the guys that are there, but we also need to include a lot of people who aren't currently in statues. Fannie Lou Hamer is a big fan, you know, is a, is a big, um, a big formative person in, in for me. Um, Barbara Jordan is another one. Um, Francis Perkins, who got us Social Security. You know, we can broaden who we commemorate, but we don't have to lose all of the other people. We just have to be more selective about what values we think they represent and what values we want people to take from them when we leave up a statue to Chester Arthur. Um, so you've spoken about the maybe the future of monuments. Um, maybe we can end with discussing the future of party politics, electoral politics in the U.S. as you see it, and maybe particularly the Republican Party. And whether Trump is gone, and I know, and I'm sure you want to talk about the difference whether Trump is gone after this election or after the next election. Um, but, um, what shape could the Republican Party and more broadly the American Party system take um, after Trump? I mean, will the Republican Party stick with Trumpism uh, after Trump or will it go in a different direction because that's suicidal? Well, first of all, you know, you often hear that this next election is the most important in our lifetime. This next election is the most important in American history, probably, because if Trump is reelected in 2000, in, in 2020, um, we will have gone ahead and uh, given him license to finish what he has started, which is the destruction of American democracy. And if we do that, then um, you and I will not be having this conversation next year. People like me are not going to be out here talking about democracy and about the things we care about. And that's, as I said, we stand on a knife edge. I don't believe that's the direction we're going to go. I'm less worried now than I was when you and I spoke two years ago when people I don't think really saw him yet for what he was. Now that they do, I, I have more confidence in us. I worry desperately about 
this the safety of this election that you know are 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 our ballots actually going to be counted? But that's a little bit of a different question than the one you're asking. So first of all we're in a really important moment in American history. Now, the question of what's going to happen to party politics, especially the Republican Party, to me is, you know, that's, that's my, that's the water I swim in. I'm fascinated by it. So first of all, um, the Republican Party cannot continue as it is. It has become a Trump party. And that is an ex extraordinarily illiberal party. It is a party driven by ideology. And it's an ideology that is actually not very popular in America. So increasingly, it has become a white nationalist party. And I think you can see this even within the last two weeks. The fact that the Republican Party advertised on Facebook using a Nazi slogan and advertised with dog whistles to neo-Nazis, uh, putting up the, the piece 88 times, for example, which is a reference to H.H. H. Heil Hitler. Um, they were all kinds of, uh, they weren't even dog whistles anymore. They basically said, join, join with us. We are essentially a Nazi party, which that was a really big moment. A lot of people didn't necessarily see that, but that was the Republican Party coming out and saying, yeah, this is, this is who we are. This was Trump coming out and saying who we are. Now, as I said, that's, there's a lot of people who call themselves Republicans who are appalled by that. And the, you see in this people like the Never Trumpers, um, Steve Schmidt, for example, who was John McCain's campaign manager, who has joined up with a uh, former Federalist lawyer, um, George Conway, a, a Harvard guy, by the way, um, to, to, to start the Lincoln Project, saying this is, this is not who we are. This is not what Republicans are supposed to be. Um, so not all Republicans are buying into this uh, white nationalism, uh, white supremacy that the Trump uh, organization has created within the Republican Party. But the two can't coexist. So what's going to happen to the Republican Party? Certainly there's a split. There's already a split and there's going to continue to be a split. The question is, does the moniker Republican Party go with the neo-Nazis or does it come back and get taken over by the, the Republicans on the ground today? And I'm not sure I want to take a stand either way on that because that depends a lot on the young demographic coming up. Has the word Republican become so tainted in their eyes that they don't want to be associated with it? And that actually may be the case. But that being said, I've said all along that when the Republican Party rose in the 1850s, it embodied a new kind of ideology that got embedded into our DNA with the Civil War, our national DNA with the Civil War. And it's very distinct from the Democratic DNA, which is also equally important to who we are. The Democrats tend to look at things as uh, us versus them, as the government that needs to put its finger on the scale to make sure the rich guys don't get everything. And we need that ideology very much in America. Sometimes it's paramount. The Republicans, in contrast, came out and said, no, what really needs to happen is the federal government needs to support people at the bottom because that creates almost, um, I hate to say a pyramid scheme, but the idea is that people at the bottom will create more than they can consume. They, in turn, will support the people above them who will, in turn, support a few financiers and industrialists who, in turn, will hire people at the bottom. So what it is, is in contrast to the Democrats looking at the world as a linear system, if you will, the Republicans, if traditionally have looked at the world as a social web. And because they look at it as a social web, they tend to focus more on traditional values, churches, families, uh, social institutions. And that way of looking at the world is equally as important to our American political discourse as the democratic way of looking at the world. So even if the Republican Party hives off to join Trump and becomes a white nationalist party. That ideology of everyone's in it together and we need to support people at the bottom with education and access to resources, that's going to recreate itself into some form of political party. But it might not call itself Republican, but that ideology, that republic, traditional Republican ideology is going to come back into existence in some form. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with the Democrats and with this split Republican Party between white nationalism and what will be some form under some name of traditional Republicanism. Are they going to be the ones who control American politics going into the 21st century? I think there's other things on the table that are as important to the political parties as the political parties to that question. And that is the is electoral reform. 
one of the reforms that we, we will get a lot of reforms if Trump gets, gets out of office. Uh, we're way overdue for um, constitutional amendments. And certainly we now understand that there's a lot of things we thought were guardrails that were not really guardrails. And those will get fixed in a period of reform that follows this administration. But one of the things that has been tested in the state of Maine is ranked choice voting. And that people were very skeptical of. I was one of the people who was skeptical of it, actually, um, when it went into place to see what would happen. And what ranked choice voting does is it permits people to, um, to vote for third parties, to vote for people whose issues are important, uh, and then those votes get transferred if that person doesn't win, those votes don't become thrown away. Your second choice, uh, actually, the vote, vote begins to count if there's not a clear winner on the first round. And when it happened in Maine, uh, the guy who got elected is a guy named Jared Golden. And he's actually really popular. It, it worked very well. A district that was torn between quite somebody quite far on the right and somebody on the left that people could not uh, felt they could not support wholeheartedly ended up getting somebody who was pretty much down the middle. And that uh, ranked choice voting has really changed the dynamic between the two parties. Because if, in fact, you could vote for a Green Party candidate or a socialist or uh, whomever you thought more accurately represented your views and knew that those votes were not going to be thrown away, that would change the dynamic of the political parties and open up a place for third, fourth, fifth parties to go ahead and start to break the monopoly that the Republicans and Democrats have had on our system for so long. So I'm not clear where we're going to end up, but I do think that, uh, you know, I still maintain that in this moment, it does not look like the current current day Republican Party held, held, headed by Donald Trump can fairly win re-election. They might be able to win re-election unfairly, but they can't fairly win election. Uh, and I think the future actually looks politically tumultuous but looks like it has the potential to recreate American democracy. And in that moment, and with that hope, I'm actually quite hopeful.